Hello everyone, this is the Tubular Quad version 6, which is a freestyle drone that I designed and built from scratch. And its biggest design feature is that it uses tubes for arms instead of your typical flat carbon plate. In this video, we're going to discuss why tubes are so great. We're gonna discuss all the different design decisions that have made this my favorite freestyle drone. And we're also gonna discuss why this design is ultimately a failure and what the future holds for my freestyle setup. So let's talk tubes and discuss why tubes are so great. First reason tubes are so great is that they are stronger and or lighter than their flat carbon plate counterparts. So the reason for this is that their cross-sectional moment of inertia is a lot higher. So basically, moment of inertia increases with more area and it also increases when you move that area further away from the center of the cross section. So tubes are good at this because they move that area far away from the center of the shape. So higher moment of inertia basically just means stronger. And if you wanna talk numbers, these tubes are 12 millimeters in diameter and just have a one millimeter wall thickness, which sounds really low, but to match the moment of inertia of that tube, you'd actually need an 8.9 by 8.9 millimeter square cross section. So I don't know of any drones that are using like a nine millimeter arm. And the big disadvantage of that would be it's a lot heavier. So that would actually be over twice as heavy as the equivalent tubular arm just to match the moment of inertia of that tubular arm. If you wanted to match the weight of these tubular arms, you'd be looking at a 5.9 by 5.9 millimeter square cross section, which is more in line with what we're used to seeing with like a five or six millimeter arm. But that moment of inertia of that arm would be over five times lower than the tubular arm. The next advantage of tubular arms is that they give the drone better vibrational characteristics. So again, because of that high moment of inertia, they're very strong and stiff for a low mass. Now, when you increase stiffness, that increases the natural frequency of a structure. And when you decrease weight, that also increases the natural frequency of a structure. And you want the drone frame to actually have the highest natural frequency as possible because your flight controller is looking at low frequencies, which is the actual movement of the drones. If your frame isn't stiff enough, it's gonna vibrate at a very low frequency, and that is going to interfere with the data that the flight controller cares about. So what this translates to is if your frame has a high natural frequency, it's easier to tune and you can run more aggressive filtering to reduce the delay in the control loop and give you a more responsive quad. And tubes are really good at making a stiff and light frame, which gives your frame a high natural frequency. Again, really good vibrational characteristics because of that high moment of inertia of the cross section of a tube. The next benefit of tubular arms is actually aerodynamics. Usually the most aerodynamic cross section is gonna be some sort of airfoil or teardrop, but that's only for a narrow range of angles of attack. For drones, they can basically have any angle of attack because they can be going through the air any which way. So we actually need a cross section that is agnostic to the angle of attack. The perfect cross section for any angle of attack is actually a circle. And guess what has a circular cross section? A tube. So a circular cross section actually has approximately a 25 to 43% lower coefficient of drag than a square cross section. I'm not sure how much that matters on our freestyle drones where we have big blocky batteries, big blocky cameras creating a lot of drag. It may be a marginal gain, but it is a gain nonetheless. The next benefit of tubular arms is that it allows you to protect your motor wires because tubes are hollow, so there's actually space to run motor wires through the arm instead of on top or underneath the arm. So they're very protected in crashes or from bent props. Uh, I can't really chop motor wires because to chop a motor wire, you would have to break the arm in half first. It's probably my favorite aspect of tubular arms just because it makes the arms look so clean and you can't see the wires. So I just listed a bunch of reasons why tubes are so great, but you may be asking, well, if tubes are so great, why don't all manufacturers use tubular arms for their designs? Now, there certainly are plenty of drones out there that use tubular arms, but they tend to be 
much larger and heavy lift drones, not really any freestyle drones. And I think there's a few reasons for this. The first of which is for those larger drones, I think that the vibrational advantages of tubular arms become much more important because larger structures generally have lower natural frequencies. So getting that natural frequency higher is much more important to make sure the flight controller doesn't have any tuning problems. Also with those larger drones, there's more budget to solve the problem of mounting a flat motor base on a circular cross section. And I think that's probably the biggest reason why you don't see any tubular arms for the freestyle drone segment. It's way easier to just order some carbon plate from Taiwan, CNC out some arms and ship it off than it is to machine some custom mount out of metal, which would be heavy, or do what I did, which is mount a flat plate on top of the arm, wrap it in carbon tow, soak it in resin. That's very labor intensive to do some kind of composite layup and labor is money and i don't think if i was selling 200 dollar frames because of the extra labor that a lot of people would buy them when you can just buy like a 50 dollar frame at the end of the day it comes down to cost and complexity it's just so much easier to cut out a flat carbon plate now with that said the advantages of tubular arms are very real and i want to talk about the other design decisions i made to make this my favorite freestyle drone. So my requirements were pretty simple. I just wanted the best feeling, best flying six inch freestyle drone. Now the six inch requirement is because I just generally prefer the way six inch twin blades fly compared to five inch tri-blades. They just have this effortlessness to the way they fly that five inch props don't have. They have really good grip. The efficiency is measurably higher. Now, the disadvantage of six inch props is that they are bigger. They generally have higher moment of inertia and that means they're less responsive. I really prioritize the responsiveness of the drone in terms of all the design elements. So starting off with the frame geometry, it's a true X design with space between all props. The true X helps give better pitch responsiveness compared to a squash X design and the distance between the props makes sure all the props get clean air which helps with efficiency and avoiding tuning problems. Other ways I wanted to improve the responsiveness specifically of the pitch axis which like long fuselage squash X drones have a big problem with. Fuselage is very short. The battery is mounted toilet tank style uh, basically the wrong way and that gets all the mass in as tight a ball as possible near the center of gravity to reduce the moment of inertia of the pitch axis of the aircraft that helps the pitch responsiveness tremendously so this has almost the same response on the pitch axis as it does on the roll axis which is a really nice experience when you're flying the tubular arms help a ton with reducing the moment of inertia of the entire frame just because they're so light and it really matters to reduce the weight further out from the center of gravity because that's where it has the biggest impact. So the lightweight arms are a big help. I'm also using very light motors because the rest of the setup is really light. So again, going off responsiveness, I wanted to decrease the weight of the quad as much as possible because that's a free way to a lower moment of inertia and increase responsiveness. So micro camera up front, UFL antenna directly to the video transmitter. In the rear, I'm only using a 4S 1300 and it's the Tattoo Funfly version, which is the lightest version I can find of a 4S 1300. Something like a 6S 1000 is a lot heavier, so I didn't want to go down that road. Not to mention they don't really make suitable motor KVs for a 6S 6 inch build of this weight. 20 by 20 stack saves a couple grams and all of these things combined allow me to run very light motors while still maintaining enough responsiveness. So these are 2205 and a half motors, which sounds absolutely minuscule, but still really responsive, has plenty of power because the all up weight of this thing with the 4S 1300 and a GoPro 8 is just 592 grams. So under 600 grams with six inch props and a GoPro. So really nice, really responsive. Again, my favorite freestyle drone by far because I kind of made all these decisions to make sure it flew the way I wanted. Now, despite this being super responsive, super light, my favorite freestyle drone ever, it was a failure in the end. So let's talk about how this drone ultimately failed. Here we have the tubular quad version six on the bench. And a few versions ago, this design only had four standoffs, two in the front, 
two in the rear and that was just not enough strength between the top and bottom plates so the bottom plate would actually fail right about here. So in the previous version, the version 5, I added a fifth standoff here to add a little bit more strength between the top and bottom plates so the bottom plate no longer fractured but in a front end collision, the top plate would deflect backwards, all the standoffs would kind of spring backwards, and the fifth standoff would actually hit the stack. But like I said, the bottom plate never fractured, so I wanted to keep that five standoff design for the version six, just cause it's lighter than adding additional standoffs. And my solution to that standoff deflection problem was just to add more space between the fifth standoff and the stack. So this actually worked well for quite a while, but at this point I think the carbon is kind of worn out and delaminated to the point where we have a lot of deflection of the top plate and that fifth standoff again. So that fifth standoff is hitting the flight controller again and I am back to breaking flight controllers. So this design in my book is a failure. So we're gonna take this apart and I'll show you the signs that this design has failed. So the top plate looks pretty good. Let's move on to the bottom plate. I can see there looks to be a little like hairline crack here and here. So it looks like even in the rear, there's been some sort of failure or a beginning of failure of the bottom plate. And then, okay, so here in the front where this fifth standoff is, there's definitely like delamination and some cracking of these layers here. And the front holes actually look okay. So between the cracking of the carbon in the rear and the delamination and cracking around the fifth standoff, you can see there are definite signs here that this design has failed. That is it for this video. I hope you guys learned something from it or at least found it entertaining. If you did, please like the video and make sure you're subscribed because in the near future, I'm going to be putting together my next freestyle setup. You definitely don't wanna miss it. I have some parts here already that are looking kind of round. So definitely don't wanna miss that getting put together. And please let me know down in the comments what you think of these more like engineering and technical focus videos, if you like them or not. I can certainly make more of them. There's gonna be plenty of opportunity with getting my next freestyle setup in the air to talk about things like PID tuning, for example. So let me know down in the comments and I hope to see you in the next few videos where we're going to be getting back in the air. Thanks for watching.